Good evening, Jessica Pimentel. Welcome on VH Berries. Good evening, Victor. How are you doing? I am extremely <laughs> grateful. How are you doing after escaping the traffic near <laughs> New York City? Oh, much better now that I'm home. It was very hectic. We had a visit from the president of the United States today, so there was traffic everywhere. But uh, now we're safe at home, back in Brooklyn, New York. Absolutely. Jessica Pimentel, in conclusion <laughs> and in definitive, we can say that you were coming from the last days of disco <laughs> to the first days of ambient. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> very good. Very good. I would love to discuss about that particular project sure. called The Last Days of Disco because this is where the entire journey of Jessica Pimentel started. Oh, yes. It was uh, one of my first, very first professional gigs. And I was just background for that show. Um, it's a it's a film with Claire Danes that it, and it was very long time ago. I think I was still in high school, and um, and it was really a wonderful experience because <laughs> there's so many things that you don't know about film and film production until you get to a set. So I got to the set and we're supposed to be in the nightclub. And what I never knew until this point was that when you see a scene where people are dancing or making music, whatever, there's no music. <laughs> so, so they would play a couple of seconds of the music so that you would start getting into it. Then they'd shut off the music so that the actors could speak. <laughs> but now you're, but you're in the, you know, you're in the groove, you're clapping, you're dancing, but your, sho your shoes are shuffling. So you had to dance without making any noise with your feet. No noise with your clothes. Fake clapping. That's why people look so stupid when they clap in movies. They because they're not <laughs> they're not clapping. They are uh, pretending to clap and pretending to dance. And then what happens usually when you shut off the music, everybody's off time again. So that's why most people look like they can't dance in the movies. So there you have it. There's a secret for you. This is a very brilliant <laughs> secret, <laughs> Jessica Pimentel. And you were, uh, as you just said, playing the uncredited mm -hmm. character of a club goer, mm -hmm. someone who goes to a nightclub for pleasure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was quite fun. It was very, very fun and a wonderful experience. I recommend it to everyone that wants to be an actor that they do some background work. After this feature film, you probably started the first days of ambient, as I just mentioned, because this is a type of music developed as a reaction against disco, uh, which is using relaxing sounds without strong voices mm -hmm. or beats. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I used to listen to a lot of ambient music when I was very young. And it's a big part of my life, for sure. Music is an important part of your life, Jessica Pimentel. And I would love to discuss about it because on one hand and on the specific scene you were dancing, you were around and in the middle of the crowd but as the day of today you are standing out can you tell us a little bit more about this musical journey absolutely um, i grew up in a very musical family um, everyone in my family loves to sing or plays an instrument um, my i grew up with my mother and my grandmother in the home and my grandmother was a chorus director for her church back in the dominican republic and every week I would learn a new hymn and I would sing it to the church every Sunday. I learned a new song to share with everyone. So music was definitely always a, a part of my life. And uh, when I was very young, 
uh, someone had gifted my mother this small, tiny violin because they knew that she had a daughter at home that might like it as a, as a, as a toy, as a toy, you know. And it was in a beat up old case with stickers on it. It was it was not in the best shape. <laughs> but the violin was actually quite nice. It worked. It, it, it was working fine. Good condition. Don't let the case fool you. <laughs> and um, so I started, you know, imitating how I thought violins go when I was making a ruckus. It sounded like I was killing cats, you know, very not very unpleasant sounding. But I was having a great time. I was like, I don't know, three, four years old, two, three, four years old. And it turns out my next door neighbor was a violinist, a concert violinist. And uh, he heard that terrible noise and decided that <laughs> that he would be a, a good Samaritan and uh, help me out a little bit. <laughs> so he would come over and um, he taught me how to hold the violin, how to tune it. He got me new strings, fixed it up really nicely for me, cleaned it, polished it, told me how to hold, hold a bow, taught me how to play each individual string one at a time and used to give me a little bit of homework. Um, and he would do this, you know, once or twice a week. Uh, and he, he was, he was wonderful, but then he, you know, he grew up, he moved away. He, he, he left things happen like that, but he taught me just enough that I knew how to tune by myself. He gave me a little harmonica with four notes. So that it's E, A, D, and G, the four strings on a violin. So I knew how to tune it myself. And then I would just play along with records because in my neighborhood of Cobble Hill, there was this little record store. And every Sunday, they would put out vinyl records that no one wanted, or they didn't think they could sell, or no one was interested in. <laughs> and most of them were classical music. So I got all these free classical vinyls, which was amazing. And, uh, and I would put them on the record player. My grandmother had a nice record player in the, in the living room with giant speakers. Well, they were giant to me, giant because I was small, but were pretty big speakers sounded great. And I would just start playing along. So I, I would play along to what I thought that they were playing. And I was teaching myself, you know, kind of to be, to be free and use my imagination and creativity and, and learn about all different kinds of music and from, you know, Bach and Beethoven and Vivaldi. And I had a lot of Baroque stuff. People, I guess they don't like that stuff because I got a lot of those records, <laughs> a, a lot of uh, Bach, uh, Vivaldi. And then one thing really hit me very, very strongly was the Mendelssohn Concerto in E minor. It's one of the most beautiful and difficult pieces I'd ever heard. And I, and I heard it, uh, the, the version I had was played by Pincus Zuckerman. And I was just fascinated by the way he played. He played so passionately, with such force, ferocity, which I, <laughs> I, I thought it was amazing because it's a violin and it's sounding like, a, sounding like fire. So I, I, I really, I was so impressed. So I made that my mission in life to learn that, that piece. And then through those records, I also learned different styles from, you know, from, from different violinists. I, I, it's Ak Perlman's my favorite violinist, the way he plays. He plays with such breath and emotion. So I learned that even you could hear two people playing the same exact thing, but they're playing completely different, even though they're saying the, the, they're playing the same notes and it's done in the same time. Their personality shines through. It's the same thing with when you're doing plays, when you're doing TV, when you're doing that. You can give two people the same script. And it will come out completely different depending on the tools and the energy of the actor. So that's something that we should, you know, that's a good lesson in life that, that even though we all have to do these repetitive things, we're, we're each individuals. We each have our own individual style, our own individual talent and gifts that we can, that we can provide to any circumstance. So no matter what you do, know that, that you're the only person that can do it your way. You're the only person that can do things your way, which is an amazing gift, which is something that I learned playing classical music where we're playing someone else's music and somehow you have to make it your own. I really like those words, Jessica Pimentel. Do not let the rusty violin cases fool you because <laughs> if the case doesn't look good, the violin inside might be extraordinary. And I truly believe that your neighbor that teached you a violin maybe left 
uh, the apartment because he accomplished his mission. <laughs> Could be. Maybe he was just an angel that came <laughs> in perfect timing. And through that, I was able to, you know, I continued playing violin. I got a, um, I was playing in an after school program in my local elementary school. And uh, the, the school that sponsored it was the Rusa School of Music. They heard me play. They gave me a, a scholarship to study there. And from then on, I got to play in chamber orchestras, small groups. I got private lessons. I got to play in the Brooklyn Borough Wide Orchestra, one of the biggest orchestras for, for the youth in New York City. And I played Carnegie Hall uh, multiple times, more times than I can count, because of, because of that one person deciding to help out the kid next door. So that really took me some amazing places. I played all around New York, all around the country. Um, and that piqued my interest in music. So it, it, then it expanded also to different kinds of music. I started playing heavy metal. <laughs> After that, I, I started playing uh, guitar around the age 14, 15. I really took a liking to heavy metal when I was a teenager. And uh, it's been uh, a very, very important part of my life from from that point on and has also taken me around the world and met some of the greatest people and and done some of the coolest things furthermore uh, jessica pimentel you are the perfect illustration that this is very important to learn a uh, true repetition and imitation which is always the case when we are beginning to learn something new Mm -hmm, absolutely. You learn to emulate and eventually you'll take what you need or what serves you or what works with you. And then slowly but surely it becomes your own. You find you what, what only you can do. Um, but it takes a lot of practice, a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of hard work, Jessica Pimentel, and to better understand your style and musicality. I think that we have to unseal the grimoire <laughs> by making an offer of Ormond. What do you think of that? I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful idea. Very good. I love it. Well, I sent that song to you. I wanted you to hear. I would love um, to discuss and elaborate about this uh, recent piece of art mm -hmm. because you delivered a violent performances and I truly felt when I was uh, hearing the, the song and the music that Uh, you were giving so much power and I even visualized uh, yourself uh, playing with your eyes closed and um, giving intensity. <laughs> Wonderful, I was and uh, I did and I, this project Valhall They're a band from Sweden. I don't, uh, well, I know that you know that I, um, I spend half my year or half my time in Sweden. We split time between <laughs> Sweden and New York City. And uh, I love, you know, I love discovering new music. Sometimes, you know, you have those streaming platforms on and it's on shuffle. It's on some kind of radio of something that you like. And one day this band came on, Val How, and it made me stop in my tracks. A song came on and I really loved their, so their style, I loved the sound. And so I, I went to their page and I listened to all their music. And then I realized they lived in the same city as me. And so I stalked them. And I told them <laughs> how much I love their music and if they ever wanted live strings, because even though they're, they're getting pretty good at these program strings, there is nothing that could ever beat live strings. Um, if they ever wanted live strings, Please let me come out of retirement just for you to play on one of your songs. And they invited me for that song. And I, and I wrote those parts that I played myself. And then they mixed them and chopped them and cut and paste them however they wanted to. And I, I couldn't have been happier with the results. It, it, it's really beautiful. It is a very uh, beautiful uh, track called Or Men's Offer by the band uh, Valhall in their album called Grimoire. And 
now that you're uh, saying uh, that um, live recordings are better, I truly understand uh, the fact that uh, this is very easy, for example, to emulate uh, piano tones, but very difficult uh, to create the same sound on the computer for the violin. The stringed instruments, especially bowed stringed instruments in general, are by far the closest to the human singing voice. They really translate very, sometimes a little too well, how the player is feeling. Um, because it's so close to your body, um, it's close to your heart, the violin, and cellos rest on you, violin, viola, cello, bass. Not only that, if you have, if you're nervous, you're shaking a bit, right? So that translates in your hands. Um, it also, uh, unfortunately for me, because I've had troubles with my hands and wrists, that shaking or lack of feeling also translates in my playing. Um, but if, if you're nervous or if you're excited, if, if you're, um, scared, it will come out in, in that bowing hand, in, in both hands. One, one, uh, creates the note and the other is the one that, that is the note, generates the note. So, so that combination of, uh, these two hands creating the note, one is the, the note and one is the breath of the note. Depending on how the player is feeling, it translates into your, in, comes out of your body into the instrument, then the instrument kind of amplifies that feeling. So it's very scary to play bowed instruments when you, when you're nervous. But not just nervous, not just nervous. It comes out, it comes out if you're, if you're happy, if you're excited, if you're rushing, if you're aggravated, you're biting into notes, maybe a little harder than you, than you normally do. Uh, if you don't like something, it, will, it, it shows very, very easily. I would say the violins and maybe perhaps the flute would be another one that really shows what you're hiding. <laughs> If I understood correctly, Jessica Pimentel, the way uh, you are holding uh, the bow <laughs> and uh, your feelings at the exact moment mm -hmm. uh, of the recording changes the entire music. Absolutely. Changes the way the note sounds, just like when people are singing when they're nervous. You can always hear it. So you can always hear it in a, in a stringed instrument as well. Do you remember, Jessica Pimentel, how many takes you did uh, for that specific track? Because sometimes it has to be in one take. Oh, no, we, we did several different types of takes. I did different parts. I did different kind of notes that they could use and pick and choose from. <laughs> so we did many different takes. So we didn't play the song the way you hear it. That's the way they arranged the different parts that we tried. So we, we, we played for a good hour, hour, two hours, something like that. You did, uh, Jessica Pimentel, a variety of takes uh, and different notes, a little bit like the letters of, of the alphabet, mm -hmm. because I truly feel that music is for you a new language and above that, a new way of expression. Absolutely. Music is the most personal language because it's a language with no words. It is a, it's just a <laughs> perception and feeling depth and how it strikes you. And it strikes each person differently, depending on how they're feeling and their perceptions and their depth, which is pretty amazing, I would say. Maybe Jessica Pimentel that you decided to build your career at the complete opposite of the last days of disco, <laughs> just because they didn't credited you. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I was only background. I was there to learn. Absolutely. And Jessica Pimentel, you just mentioned before that uh, you had uh, sometimes a little bit of pain in the hand, uh, the fingertips, by playing uh, too much of the violence. In this case, 
maybe that sh you should go to a massage <laughs> therapist and i would recommend dr dolores dr dolores <laughs> i don't know if you want to go to her <laughs> you might you might go in but you might not come out I might not come out. This is something that I didn't knew because you are the one part of this um, television series that is coming out in the upcoming future. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Oh, yes. I am so, so, so excited about this project because it's been in the works <laughs> for over 10 years. Um, it started off as a, a, a project, as a one-woman show done in the labyrinth um, by Miss Daphne Rubin Vega, one of my favorite actresses who I've always looked up to since I, before I started this journey as an actor. Um, and I got to see her perform this particular role. I think it was at uh, Joe's Public Theater, Joe's Pub. I think it was there. Don't quote me on that. But in that area, there's a block of theaters there, was in that block. And, uh, and I was mesmerized by this character. I said, one day I'm going to play Dolores Roach. I need to do this play one day. Um, just, just because she had us all in the palm of her hand and the story was incredible. It was unbelievable. It was just horrific and funny and so real and so out there, strange, crazy, like nothing I'd ever heard before. Really so cool, dark and gri <laughs> grimy and fantastic. And it's very rare that you see a female get to play such intense characters. So it went from the play, they developed it into a radio play, or a, people call it a podcast. I say it's a good old-fashioned radio play. Um, and you have some of the greatest New York theater actors that are, are in this podcast, in this radio play. So cool. You're going to recognize probably every voice when you listen to it. And they developed this into a radio play that was equally captivating as, a, as the original one woman show. Um, it is it just so cool, expands a little bit more on the story. And then finally it became so popular that they had developed it into a TV show for Amazon. Um, and it's coming out July 7th. It's about a, a young lady who ends up going to prison because of something her boyfriend does. And when she comes out, I believe it's 16 years later, she comes out to find an entirely new world in New York City. So if you've ever heard of the show Dexter, or if you've ever heard of the musical Sweeney Todd, it kind of combines those with uh, the, the, the musical and movie In the Heights. So if you think of uh, the serial killer as a, uh, as a Latina from Washington Heights, that might, <laughs> that's gonna kind of explain a lot to you. Coming into a new world, trying to figure out how to survive. Jessica Pimentel, you just saved my life because <laughs> now I won't be going uh, to Dr. Dolores. Even true, I don't have a specific pain in the hands because I am not an avid uh, violinist. <laughs> oh, well, she's actually very, she's quite good at what she does. Just don't piss her off. Absolutely, uh, Jessica Pimentel and uh, this television series uh, called The Horror of Dolores Roach is coming out, as you just mentioned, on July 7th on uh, the Amazon platform. And you just made a parallel with this story and Dexter meeting Sweetney Toads from the musical The Demon Barber of Fleet uh, Street that came out in 1979. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know anything about the show, there's some special meat pies that get made in this show. I think that's all I'm going to say for now.
And Jessica Pimentel, how would you describe your character called Flora Frias? Because right from the beginning, I don't think that this is the type of person with an artistic background who went, for example, to the PS 261. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> Flora Frias is actually a, 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 um, an award-winning actress and who started her life in telenovelas. And she's coming to a Broadway to prove herself. And she's been working on this project called Dolores Roach. And she studied this uh, urban legend of this masseuse that works in a basement under an empanada store. And so she helped develop this play about Dolores Roach that goes on Broadway and becomes a huge success. Absolutely, in definitive, uh, Flora Frias never went uh, to 314 <laughs> Pacific Street, oh but you did. And I would love to know more about, uh, <laughs> now we are coming back on your journey, about the genesis starting in this specific school. Okay, in my elementary school. <laughs> Absolutely, because this is a place um, that was focused uh, mostly on the arts. And I feel that it cultivated your appreciation for both music and uh, acting, for example, with Michael Polinski. <laughs> that was my junior high teacher, yes. But in my elementary school, we did have a great focus on the arts. We had a wonderful teacher, Mr. Richard Brooks, who was the choir choral director. We would do whole entire musicals in elementary school. We did a Christmas talent show uh, that, that was, uh, you know, like for us, it was like Broadway worthy. Uh, <laughs> we felt at least. Um, and we would go um, on field trips, monthly field trips. He took us to the opera. We saw Def De Deflator Mouse and we saw L'Elysée d'Amour. We saw um, uh, Carmen. We saw, <laughs> we, we went to the opera quite regularly in elementary school. And we also went to Broadway shows quite regularly as school trips. Um, not only that, we, we studied uh, great works of art very, very, at a very young age. I remember Miss Beatrice Schwartz, my second grade teacher, saw that I was kind of bored in school a lot of times. And she asked me to bring in a book that I that I wanted to read and I could read by myself in a corner. And I brought in a book that my mother had in her shelf. It was called Macbeth by William Shakespeare. And I, I wanted to know what language it was in because I really, I, I was like, I, I think this is English, but it's very hard. So she taught me in the second grade how to uh, start deciphering Shakespearean text, so to speak. We also had an amazing um, gifted and talented program. Uh, the gifted was not just musical, but also arts and, sci arts and sciences and mathematics and such. So we were allowed to, we had a computer in our room. We learned how to program computers. We had a little robot that we could make draw things for us. Um, we had a, a really one, we had really wonderful teachers that, um, really wanted us to explore the world of, of all types of subjects, not just music, but uh, like I said, the sciences and, and just um, literature in general. We would read these wonderful books and have great discussions sitting in the round on the floor together. Um, and then as we got older and they saw that our interests were taking shape, they were very um, adamant about pushing us towards those goals and the things that we were interested in. So a lot of us started liking sciences and physics and cosmology, astronomy, and uh, they would take us to uh, a CUNY, the city city of uh, city University of New York, where we would take classes with Michio Kaku, the great physicist, or we would listen to uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, do a lecture or, or something. So we were allowed to sit in at, in college lectures even at an early age, in, in on, under twelve years old just so that we would start absorbing that knowledge, see what that's about. 
So I was very fortunate there. And then from then was junior high, which was another school for gifted and talented children, where we would spend a large chunk of the day in your major, whether your major was dance or music or art or math or science. You would do your academics in one part of the day and then your your talent in the other. And that's when I started taking drama classes in junior high school with Dr. Mr. Michael Polensky. <laughs> with Mr. Michael Polinski. And as a matter of fact, Jessica Pimentel, PS261, invited you to explore new horizons, new landscapes, and maybe some similar uh, to the one in Sweden, <laughs> because this is a land that you are appreciating a lot. And I feel that these places in Europe is giving you more than half of your inspiration. Absolutely. Such, such beautiful places. And uh, I'm lucky that I have a life where I get to travel a lot and see a lot of new, new <laughs> places and new people, new things. It's, it's really amazing. Where do you see your journey with music? For example, uh, Ormond's Offer, the television series coming soon. Where do you see yourself between those two places and your current projects in general? Well, I am currently working on music in several projects. We have a, a, a new album coming out with one of my bands, Brujeria. Hopefully it'll be out in the fall. Um, I am doing also some little side projects with some uh, some friends who are I can't really discuss it yet. I'm sorry, <laughs> but we are doing we're writing we're writing music <laughs> that we're hoping we can get uh, playing on on in in movies and films and TV shows uh, and and songs that we really you know songs we really enjoy. So. If I understood correctly, Jessica Pimentel, if you reveal the projects you are working on with your friends, they are going to unplug your microphone. They will. They're right here. They're looking at me. They're giving me dirty looks. They say, you can't, you can't mention who's in the project. But uh, yes, and we just come out with something called Shredders, which is a, a kind of like a heavy metal super group. Uh, that's a, it's a little bit like the gorillas. It's cartoon characters. And we just released a song a few days ago, May 6th. Um, so you can take a look at that, Shredders with a Z, and take a look at, at what we have in store. We'll be releasing music uh, little by little as the days go by. I am looking forward uh, to see you pushing the limits and challenging the saturation effect on every of the microphone you're <laughs> using. Thank you very much, <laughs> Jessica Pimentel. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>